It's over. It's done. It's finally done. 2020, the year from hell, is over. Politics aside, the year was actually particularly interesting from a biological sciences point of view. So let's get into the top science and biology related news stories of 2020. Lots of new species were discovered, both living and extinct. For example, scientists described the fossils of a giant hyperpredator that lived in the earliest eons of the terrestrial pteropod ecology. And even older than that were the freshly discovered fossils of one of the first scorpion species that had ever adapted to life on dry land. Similarly, scientists also discovered a fossilized slime mold, representing the oldest such slime mold species ever known. There was the discovery of the earliest known bilaterally symmetrical animal, which is the first animal organism to have a distinct head and tail region and distinct left and right sides. The amazing Myanmar amber deposits kept producing incredible finds, as usual, including a new clade of ancient bee and the skull of the smallest species of dinosaur. In the oceans, a fascinating experiment on benthic ecology led to the discovery of several species of aquatic, bone-eating worms. And another study identified the fossils of a car-sized aquatic turtle in South America. Some scientists tried to be creative with the names they gave their discoveries, such as the group that found a new species of tyrannosaur and named it after the Greek god of death, or the researchers who discovered a new viper species in India and named it after a character from Harry Potter. On the far western edge of the Sahara Desert, in Morocco, scientists found the fossils of three pterosaur species, which had never been seen so far south before, and a study examining ancient megafauna ecologies found that a particular region of Mesozoic Africa was dominated by an unreal number of enormous and terrible predators, which the researchers described as being like the most dangerous place on Earth. There was also a strange species of microbe that was discovered living in African mosquitoes, and something they were doing to their host completely shut down the malaria life cycle. The medical implication here is that if we can inoculate a significant portion of the mosquito population with this microbe, we can drastically reduce malaria transmission rates and save tens of thousands of lives a year. In other medical news, scientists noted that the bacteria that causes whooping cough is evolving into a drug-resistant superbug. Regular aerobic exercise improved the volume and activity of gray matter in the brain. The lamination or structural organization of the white matter in the brain has been strongly linked to intelligence. The cause of migraine headaches was possibly identified as strange abnormalities in the visual cortex. Various classes of metal-containing compounds are being championed as the latest way to address emergent genetic resistance in many strains of bacteria, and it was found that certain kinase enzymes are key defensive tools used by Plasmodium falciparum which is the deadliest strain of malaria in the world. The 3D skin printer technology that I talked about last year is still being improved upon, with the most recent developmental iteration producing a skin printer gun, which can cover huge areas of wounded or burned skin. A robot was built that scans for veins and draws your blood way more accurately and efficiently than a human can, and an intensive economic study in the United States found that the Medicare for All Act would save an average of 68,000 lives and almost half a trillion dollars every year. In the field of evolutionary research, scientists discovered an ancient fish whose forelimb fossils reveal a lot about the evolution of arms and hands from the more ancestral lobe and fin. News about recent species included stories about a parasitoid wasp species, noticed to be developing a symbiosis with a pox virus, which makes the wasp's sting incredibly dangerous, because now not just are you getting the wasp's toxin, you know, and the pain from that in the sting, you might also be getting injected with a pox virus. There was also a huge study in China that determined that the Chinese paddlefish has gone extinct. And a giant tortoise who had spent much of his life in a zoo returned to his home island. The fun little detail about this giant tortoise is that while in captivity, he was used as a stud to breed with as many fertile females as possible, and all of his uh, resultant offspring were relocated back to their home island. And so his efforts are believed to have single-handedly saved his population from decline and extinction. So that's pretty incredible. Good for you, buddy. 
In South America, the drug lord Pablo Escobar had imported several hippos from Africa, and after Pablo Escobar was killed in a running gunfight with the authorities, his hippos were left to roam free. And now their population is growing, and they're, they're massively affecting the local ecosystem in this, this area of northern South America. Colonies of red coral that live in Mediterranean protected areas are showing signs of improvement and regrowth. And North American bats, whose numbers were savaged by a fungal infection called white nose syndrome, are showing signs of adaptation and resistance to the disease. There was some more awesome research that involved genetics and genetic modifications, including the sequencing of the Indian cobra genome, which will help with efforts to study venom and create antivenoms. And golden rice, a species of rice genetically modified to produce beta-carotene, which the body will then convert to vitamin A, has been approved for commercial use in the Philippines, which is really great because it'll help fight the epidemic of childhood blindness caused by vitamin A deficiency. Now, the near future will also have its fair share of news about climate change and the human impact on the world. In late 2019 and early 2020, Australia was ravaged by colossal wildfires, which killed over a billion reptiles, mammals, and birds, and countless invertebrates. And a new enzyme was synthesized that can degrade a common type of plastic with record-breaking speed and efficiency. There were also some pretty incredible news events about life in space. Because of increasingly powerful observational technologies, astronomers are pushing for public funding as the benefits of their work are beginning to permeate into daily life. Some scientists speculate about the possibilities of life existing or persisting on planets orbiting dead stars, like white dwarfs. NASA identifies organic chemicals in the outer coating of a strange, bilobed asteroid named Arakoth. The New Horizons probe found evidence of a subsurface ocean on... Pluto, of all places. The Kepler telescope identified an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of its star, which is really good news for the search for life. And a fascinating study suggested that life may be able to exist on planets with huge, fluffy, hydrogen-rich atmospheres. There was also an interesting research poll that examined Americans' relationship to science, scientific institutions and authorities, and science's role in politics. Okay, so everything that I've mentioned so far are all news stories that I actually had a chance to cover on the podcast. But, as you might have noticed, around the middle of the year, I stopped posting news stories. I stopped posting pretty much entirely. And this is because my son was born. He was several weeks premature, and we spent a long time in the NICU. And for the first few months after we got back home, <laughs> I wasn't getting any sleep. And because of the baby and grad school... I just had no time at all to work on my podcast. However, despite my temporary hiatus, the world of science did not stop churning out incredible biological news. And now, I regret that I, I didn't do individual pieces on each of the following stories at the time, because they're all really incredible and really interesting. But the next best thing I can do is a brief mention of each here. So, in the medical field... The risk of breast cancer has been linked to use of hair dye and chemical hair straighteners. Diagnostic AI was found to be just as good and even slightly better than human doctors at identifying image-based evidence of diseases, cancers, and other maladies. An advanced 3D printing technology is able to print living skin with built-in blood vessels. <laughs> That's amazing! Scientists in Italy used cutting-edge robotic technology with laser cutters and 3D cameras to successfully perform a surgery in a building nine miles away from the patient. This technology has huge implications for robotic surgery equipment installed in the space station. And CRISPR technology has been used to cure genetic diseases in three human patients, two of whom had a severe form of beta thalassemia and a third who had sickle cell anemia. A research team at Harvard identified a group of molecules that were shown to restore telomere length in mice, and researchers in Israel used high-oxygen therapy to increase telomere length in blood cells. And these are both huge advancements in the field of anti-aging therapies. The cause of the bad smell in body odor has been traced back to the CT lyase enzyme of a bacteria that lives in our armpits. Researchers have identified a way to reverse myelin sheath degradation in neural cells, potentially protecting against the effects of Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. 
and an experimental blood test is able to detect extremely early traces of cancer, up to four years before the onset of any symptoms. Because cancer is best treated early, an early detection test like this will save countless lives. There was also some really interesting news about drugs. There were multiple studies about the psychedelic compound psilocybin, finding that its effects included an increased awareness of beauty and positive mood, reductions in depression and better acceptance of difficult and stressful life experiences, and that it can induce long-term increases in mindfulness and beneficial alterations to serotonin receptor activity. Additional research on psilocybin found that it can alter the expression of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Specifically, it can reduce glutamate activity in the hippocampus, and this, in turn, was found to produce the mystical psychedelic experience of ego death, where one's ego is obliterated and replaced with an existential sense of interconnected oneness with all reality. Studies on cannabis found that its growing popularity is counterbalanced by a reduction in alcohol consumption. Legal cannabis access can significantly reduce the use and abuse of prescription opioids, and cannabis use in pregnancy has been found to be associated with slower gestational development, lower birth weight, head size and birth length, and higher neonatal risk of disease and death. LSD, DMT, and other psychedelics were the subject of a few neat studies this year, including one that found that psychedelics' therapeutic effects included reductions in depression and anxiety, and a better ability to live in the present moment. Experiencing the incredibly weird phenomenon of the, the DMT entities, or the, the so-called machine elves, was found to have effects similar to alien abduction, near-death experiences, and religious experiences in how it affects the patient's worldview. Ketamine was found to be able to regenerate neural plasticity in the hippocampus, which is typically reduced during the onset of depression. Among a plethora of fascinating animal studies, there was, uh, there was research that provided reinforcing evidence for the irreplaceable value of predators for ecological management of large, unhealthy herds. There was research that provided more evidence for the startling intelligence, empathy, and theory of mind of the African gray parrot. Scientists installed human genes regulating brain growth into monkeys, and they were able to make the monkeys' brains grow larger, in what the researchers are describing as a replication of evolution. Another study found that zebra stripes seem to deter parasitic insects, and painting stripes on cattle could be an ecological alternative to pesticides. Some research on human evolution found that when the first peoples arrived in Australia and made it their home, they coexisted for many thousands of years with megafauna, including massive species of reptile, kangaroo, wombat, emu, and more. The analysis of the first complete dinosaur skeleton uh, first discovered over 150 years ago, has finally been completed. The excellent fossils of a giant salamander that lived during the Triassic era have been discovered and analyzed, and are giving paleontologists and evolutionary biologists a field day with information on early amphibian evolution. Using a variety of dating techniques, researchers found that the myriapods, the centipedes and millipedes and relatives, likely emerged several million years earlier than currently thought in a co-evolutionary relationship with early plants. Research has identified three separate compounds in the Brazilian pepper tree that can disrupt quorum sensing in bacteria communities and interfere with staph infections. This is a great use for a tree that's an otherwise invasive, itchy, smelly, and all-around unpleasant plant. 359 million years ago, there was a mass extinction event known as the Late Devonian Extinction. And for decades, researchers didn't know what caused it. But a new paper provides compelling evidence that the mass extinction was caused by a drop in temperature that led to depletion of the ozone layer, leading to heavy UVB bombardment of the surface. All of that radiation would have killed off a huge portion of the life that existed at the time. And in the aftermath of another mass extinction, in this case, the KT extinction that killed the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, when the global ecology was recovering after this event, giant predatory anchovies appeared in the oceans, and these are, indeed, related to the same herbivorous anchovies that some people like to put on their pizza. Another study found that when pollen in the environment is rare, bees were observed to nibble on a plant's leaves 
to stimulate earlier blooming. How this works and how the bees figured it out is not yet quite understood. Other research found that bumblebees can feel objects, and then later identify the objects by sight alone, suggesting advanced mental imagery capabilities that are unexpected for a small and relatively simple bee brain. A rare species of blue bee, thought to have been driven to extinction, has actually been rediscovered in a small area in Florida. Extracts of honeybee venom have been used to rapidly kill hard-to-treat types of breast cancer, and they could reduce tumor growth when combined with traditional chemotherapy. A study on the physiology of cicada wings found that they're covered in microstructures that can actually rip up and break apart a bacteria on contact. A study identified the surprising importance of moths as nocturnal pollinators. A huge nest of invasive murder hornets was found and destroyed, preventing the spread of nearly 200 queens in the United States. Research into guerrilla social groups identified a trend, wherein, as the population grew, social relationships became weaker and more distant, which is a trend that's also seen in multiple primate species, including humans. Research into the laughter of children and adult apes, including gorillas, chimps, bonobos, and orangutans, has found that laughter is likely a trait evolved near the beginning of the ape family tree, and it's shared among all of the ape cousins, including us. Hibernating grizzly bears don't lose that much muscle from inactivity, because their bodies produce extra amino acids that sustain muscle growth, which has therapeutic implications for people in a coma, or astronauts in microgravity. This is important because another study that looked at the risks of living in space found that not only does microgravity and cosmic radiation reduce muscle mass and damage our vision, bones, and immune system, but that it also damages our mitochondria and has negative effects on our organs, particularly our liver. New developments in agricultural technology include demonstrations of lab-grown meat, where the scientists grew rabbit and bovine muscle tissues on edible gelatin scaffolds. Also, red romaine lettuce grown on the space station has been found to be similar to earth-grown lettuce with respect to the various nutrients and antioxidants and microbial profiles, and they're actually even more nutritious with respect to specific nutrients like potassium. A study on coffee plants has found some startling and rather upsetting news. Climate change is likely to have negative effects on coffee plants, reducing the quantity and quality of coffee beans. In a surprising discovery on the outside of the International Space Station, bacterial colonies can apparently survive in outer space for years by using a protective outer coating of dead cells to protect the still-living inner cells. In another surprising discovery, this time from kilometers below the seafloor, scientists found a 100-million-year-old community of living, reproducing microbes. A study suggests that Venus may have become a hothouse hell planet only relatively recently, and may have actually had semi-habitable conditions for millions, if not billions, of years. A newly discovered exoplanet might be a temperate ocean world with huge implications for alien life. And there was another paper that took a crack at the Drake Equation, where the researchers plugged in the most modern and cutting-edge data to get as theoretically accurate an estimation as possible, and among the range of possible outcomes that they calculated, the statistically most likely outcome is that there may be 36 intelligent communicating civilizations, including us, alive in the Milky Way galaxy right now. All right, so now that I've run through a few of the biggest biological news stories of 2020, it's time to pick what I think are the top three most profound, important, and significant news stories of the year. But first, the honorable mention. This year's honorable mention goes to the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere on Venus. Now, I really wish I had the time to do an isolated piece on this news, and I actually might in the future because it's that fascinating. Essentially, some astronomers identified a small organic chemical called phosphine about 60 miles up in Venus's atmosphere. This is a compound that cannot be made in sufficient quantities by any known geological process that occurs on Earth or Venus. But on Earth, there are some anaerobic microbial organisms that can metabolize minerals to produce phosphine, so in this sense, it's a profoundly strong biosignature, a form of chemical evidence that, if we were to observe it in the alien sky of an alien planet, 
would be highly suggestive of life. Furthermore, phosphine should break down quickly in the Venusian atmosphere, but as the phosphine persists, there must be some process that's generating it and replenishing it in the atmosphere. That process, I think, likely belongs to a lineage of alien microbial life forms. Now, the astronomers quickly tried to debunk the biogenesis hypothesis in any way they could, but there was simply no other known geological or physical mechanism that could produce the phosphine. So they either identified a novel abiotic geological process that produces phosphine on Venus, which is kind of unlikely, or, and uh, in my opinion this is more likely, they identified a phosphogenic organism, likely an aerosolized population of microbes living in the cooler, higher altitude regions of the atmosphere of Venus. What's really neat is that this might be evidence in support of the airborne alien microbe hypothesis that formed after we noticed unexplained fluctuations of UV absorption in Venus's upper atmosphere. Now, this is really significant, because a possible explanation for this phenomenon, for this UV fluctuation, is an aerosolized community of microbes that absorb UV light with pigment proteins, perhaps even engaging in a kind of high-energy photosynthesis. Scientists are already planning missions to Venus, such as Andreas Hein and Venasia Lingam, who wrote up a proposal and submitted it to the Astrophysical Journal Letters. They want to use parachute-slowed balloons that would float at about 50 to 60 kilometers up in the Venusian atmosphere, which is the altitude where we detected the phosphine, and where temperate Earth-like atmospheric conditions may exist. The balloon probes would use microscope imaging techniques to observe any potential microbial life forms, and would be equipped with a petri dish and sensor bay to perform rudimentary chemical analyses. Now, before I get too carried away with this potential discovery of alien life, I, I mean, I, I love it, but I really have to mention that after this discovery was announced, there was a lot of effort put into replication and falsification. Telescopes and spectroscopes around the world were turned towards Venus in an attempt to verify the phosphine signal. And unfortunately, to date, there has been no verification. So it's possible that this phosphine signal was in error and it's not actually there, in which case this whole story is a really big false positive. But even with this taken into consideration, I still think that this is a fantastic news story, because, one, it's created a huge burst of public interest in astronomy and science generally, and two, alien life is my favorite biological subject of all time, so how could I not mention this, you know? I debated with myself whether or not to put this story in the top three, but... Ultimately, as incredibly awesome as it would be that we maybe possibly just might have found tantalizing evidence of alien life on Venus, the lack of validation and replication bumps the story down to an honorable mention. Alright, now we get to the actual top three stories. So in third place, I chose a story that came out later in the year. In Singapore, the government has approved chicken meat for sale. Not regular chicken meat, though, not from a living bird. This was meat produced in a bioreactor. The cultured muscle tissue was grown from chicken cells taken from a cell bank, and all the nutrients supplied to the tissue culture came from plants, which, if you think about it, really isn't much different than the actual birds eating plant-based chicken feed. So, to be brief, this is chicken meat that was grown with absolutely no death to any animals. The only animal product that they used was blood serum extracted from fetal cows, which was necessary for an initial step in the process. However, the company doing this, called Eat Just, is transitioning to a plant-based serum that wasn't available when they began the legal application process several years ago. Eat Just is at the forefront of an agricultural revolution, which produces meat grown from cell cultures instead of living animals. So no cow or pig or chicken will ever need to be slaughtered for food for any person who can buy cultured meat at a grocery store. Other companies involved in this agricultural revolution are Memphis Meats, Elif Farms, Mission Barns, Finless Foods, Supermeat.com, Future Meat Technologies, New Age Meat, and Mosa Meat, who are all working on developing various meat products, including steak with authentic muscle texture, crispy chicken, bacon, and of course, these Eat Just Chicken Nuggets. There are massive benefits to this technology, and I chose this story for the number three slot because it really shows how far things have come, where we are, 
and what we can realistically expect in the coming decade and beyond. Removing the need to slaughter a living animal is a great benefit, but it's actually just the tip of the iceberg. If we don't need to slaughter a living animal, we don't need slaughterhouses, and we don't need massive industrial farms overpacked with cows and pigs. If we remove those farms, we also remove the vast lakes of piss and shit that poison the local environment, and we can give huge tracts of land back to nature, to be used to restore ecosystems and allow for the grazing of wild herds of animals. If we wanted to keep using the land for farming, we could use the land for grazing for milk cows and other animals that don't need to be slaughtered. In addition, we don't need to prophylactically slather the animals in antibiotics because of the terrible hygiene conditions they're kept in, and this will have huge benefits in the fight to slow down the spread of antibiotic resistance genes in pathogenic bacteria. So, in a nutshell, Singapore approving the sale of cultured chicken meat is a massive step forward and a critically important issue. This process, this way of producing meat, will be brought to scale. It will become price competitive with existing meat production methods, and it will eventually win out, because it's ethically superior, because of the incredible health and environmental benefits, and of course, because there's no longer a need to slaughter any animals for food. For second place, there are several news stories that I'm bundling up into one big package that I'm calling the Biotech Revolution. What I mean by this is that this year has seen a rapid series of huge advancements in biotechnology. I already mentioned the stories about a diagnostic image scanning AI, a 3D skin printer for burns, and technology that, al that allows surgeons to conduct remote surgeries, but these are all small potatoes compared to the two big biotech achievements that I've put in this second place slot. So the first big achievement was the development of a program using Google's DeepMind AI that they call AlphaFold and AlphaFold2. This program solved a problem in biological sciences that stood for nearly 50 years. AlphaFold is able to calculate how proteins, large complex molecules with lots of polar and nonpolar components, are able to fold into specific shapes, specific functional conformations. The basic idea here is that if you know the amino acid sequence of the protein, you can predict its final 3D folded structure. However, it turns out that the math behind these predictions is absurdly complicated, with your typical average protein having some 10 to the power of 300 possible conformations. For nearly 50 years, we've been unable to find a practical way to solve these equations, but now, decades before scientists thought we'd ever be able to find a solution to the protein folding problem, AlphaFold has figured it out. The practical benefits here are enormous as AlphaFold will radically improve our understanding of protein structure, function, and interactions in all kinds of biological processes. It's basically a massive boost to biological research capabilities, and it will lead to a more rapid development of things like protein-based or protein-targeting medications. Now, the second big achievement in biotechnology that is tied for second place is a software program developed by researchers at Johns Hopkins University which has a revolutionary method for sequencing DNA. The technology rapidly speeds up DNA sequencing tasks by profiling the genome and prioritizing uh, the specific gene types of interest to the researcher. The time that it takes to sequence a genome and identify mutations can theoretically be reduced by 80% with this method. Even better, this software can be used in portable sequencing tools, so researchers can theoretically go out into the field find some slime mold or a bug or a slug or some kind of vertebrate somewhere, sample some tissue, and sequence the DNA right there in the field. So if I understand the implications of this correctly, if the field biologist is staying in a campsite for a few days while doing their surveys or data collection, they can have the genetic sequencing data available right there in the field without having to return to the lab. This is a massive convenience, and it will make it easier to sequence the genome of virtually everything, thus improving our biochemical understanding of virtually everything. And finally, we come to the greatest biological news story of 2020. The first place story is the coronavirus. <laughs> I know you're sick of hearing about it, but I covered the coronavirus way back in January, when it was still emerging in China. And a few weeks later, I did a follow-up piece explaining that the coronavirus had spread globally, and things were about to get really bad. 
And, well, the rest of 2020 happened. Global lockdowns, border closures, travel restrictions, quarantines, masks and social distancing, and the misguided protests against them. Trump corrupting the CDC and tampering with data. The huge amount of research that went into developing a vaccine, like the work on llama antibodies. And learning what coronavirus does, such as the realization that it was a blood vessel disease transmitted through the air. There were millions of cases worldwide, and countless tens of thousands of deaths, including well over 300,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. This outbreak event has been world-changing, with massive social, economic, and political consequences. When I was first doing research on the coronavirus, the early mortality estimates in the U.S., you know, around March or April, estimated that we could have anywhere from about 150 to about 220,000 deaths. And I very clearly remember thinking that 220,000 deaths was an absurd number, absolutely ridiculous, and that it would never get that bad. But as the year dragged on, and the death toll rose, I was just left speechless. The sheer failure of the federal government to coordinate and execute a proper pandemic response protocol was unimaginable. It was awful. The coronavirus has left scars across the world, but the U.S. in particular, due to the malice and incompetence of its leadership, I think will bear the deepest scars of all. All right, everyone, so that's the Biology Science News Recap for the year 2020. I'm really excited to see what'll happen in the year 2021. But if it's anything remotely like 2020, if it's, if it's just a third as bad as 2020, I'm excited, but goddamn, I'm kind of nervous about it too. If 2021 is gonna be crazy, let's hope that it's like, friendly aliens make contact crazy, or we cured cancer with a cheap drug crazy. Just as long as it's not, here's another deadly super pathogen to destroy your civilization crazy.